I actually left my laptop at the college and I'm on my desktop. So sorry about that. Uh, no problem. Well, you, you've got, uh, you've got you control. So go ahead. Yep. Oh God. I, that's not the button. There we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my advisor was uh, James Lee and my project was the creation of a vector magnet with cylindrical permanent magnets. Um, now the question of why make a vector magnet is to analyze the magnetic properties of materials. I think most people are familiar with uh, the textbook example of like a magnetic dipole and the field created by that. But in materials, you get a lot more complicated magnetic domains, such as seen in this figure on the right in um, a thin film of yttrium iron garnet. And uh, the reason that you might want to study these domain patterns yeah. and materials is that they have a lot of applications in things such as memory and storage and computers. And the way that these domains are formed is typically due, or in this case, is due to a strong magnetic field perpendicular to the thin sample. And so our team is hoping to be able to observe similar property or like similar effects in materials by creating a strong magnetic field and moving it around a sample and seeing how the domains within that sample change. Um, so the goals for our vector magnet and like the actual properties we wanted to have is maximum magnitude of half a Tesla. We are okay with going greater than that because that just gives us more freedom to study more interesting properties. Uh, we want field divergence of less than 5% from the center of the sample to any point in the field. Um, we want to be able to control the magnitude of the field smoothly from zero Teslas all the way to its maximum magnitude. And we want to be able to control the direction of the field 360 degrees around the sample. Um, we also need to leave room in the middle for a laser to reflect off the sample. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a bit. Um, and the, we want our sample region to be um, minimum of five millimeters by five millimeters, yeah, five millimeters cubed. Now, what we're actually able to achieve using permanent magnets was a maximum magnitude of 0.7 Tesla and a minimum of zero. Uh, field divergence of at maximum 2.2% on the x-axis at 0 0.7 Tesla, minimum 1.2% at 0 0.6 Tesla. On the y-axis, maximum 5% at 0 0.7 Tesla, minimum 0% at 0 0.26 Tesla. And on the z-axis, maximum 3% at 0 0.45 Tesla and minimum 1.2% at 0 0.7 Tesla. And the x-axis in this case refers to, well, I'll actually tell you what the x-axis refers to later when I have a figure. It is difficult to explain with that one. Um, and we found that it's actually not possible to get the size of sample we wanted. That's not a deal breaker, though, because we're able to work with a smaller sample region just because the permanent magnets that we are using aren't able to create enough uniformity in as big of a size as we wanted. Like 2.5 millimeters is the biggest sample region we can actually use with permanent magnets. And the reason we're going with permanent magnets instead of electromagnets, which are typically used in vector magnets, is mainly to save costs, because otherwise it would be tens of thousands of dollars versus 1,000. Um, now, I found in order to create a vector magnet, uh, we need to find the ideal configuration for the magnets. And I found with the strength of magnets, it was unreasonable to try to test various configurations just because trying to move the magnets that close to one another with a, a prototype setup poses like a serious safety risk because there's a high risk of pinching or damage to the magnets. And so I found it was safer and easier to go with a simulation approach. And I decided to implement uh, an analytic solution that was proposed in the paper, exact expressions for the magnetic field of a finite cil cylinder with arbitrary uniform magnetization because they had a section on there where the magnetization was longitudinal around the length of the cylindrical magnet, which is exactly what our magnets were. And I created that simulation in Python. Um, and the solution was mainly based on elliptical integrals, which I had a solver for in Python. And it was all based in cylindrical polar coordinates. I'm avoiding getting into the math because there was quite a bit and it would take more than 15 minutes to explain. Um, and so here are some of the results from my simulation. Um, visually, you can see that it lines up well with real world magnetic fields. You're able to see the vector lines. And if this wasn't an image, I could move it around. You could see them in 3D. And here's another example of that, comparing it to another 
uh, way of visualizing magnetic fields in real life compared to my simulation. And using the simulation, we were able to settle upon a configuration of eight magnets uh, configured what I'm calling uh, pairwise, where it is in two pairs of four magnets that will move uh, away from each other along what I'm calling the x-axis, which is the direction that these arrows are pointing um, of the field. And so they would move, they would separate along this bottom axis here and separate apart in groups of four. <laughs> I, that, yeah. Um, and you can note, like visually looking at this cluster, which would be the sample region, that the divergence of the field is very small. Um, and so in order to actually like calculate, now that I, once I found that this was my ideal configuration, I then needed to find how far apart the magnets should be both vertically and uh, horizontally, horizontally being the Y axis in this case, vertically being the Z axis. And in order to calculate that, I A, had to keep in mind that there will be material between these and because the magnets would be housed in something. And then I also needed to run through a large uh, amount of possible points, which I did by just sweeping through um, a bunch of configurations and a bunch of different values for the Y separation and Z separation until I uh, finally settled upon one that was in this region here where it had the yellow. Um, and in order to interpret this graph, uh, so the colors refer to they correspond to like a magnitude and divergence. And so the yellow is when it is above half a, me half a Tesla and the divergence is above 5%. Um, the blue is region is when it is above half a Tesla and the divergence is less than 5%. The green region is when it is less than half a Tesla and the divergence is less than 5%. And the red, which isn't in this diagram, um, is when the magnitude would be less than half a Tesla and greater than, and the divergence greater than 5%. Um, and so using this figure, I was able to see that this region would give me both an area that was stronger than we actually wanted from the magnitude and still within the divergence, as well as a region with high magnitude and higher divergence. And that would give us more freedom to do some experience that, experiments that might require more magnetic field than we initially planned for in the future, giving the apparatus more flexibility. Um, and we finally, and I finally settled upon um, an ideal uh, separation of uh, 0.6 inches along the y-axis that's uh, measured from the center of the magnet to the um, xz plane, and then uh, 0.56 inches for the z-axis measured from the center of the magnet again to the xy plane. Um, and so with that configuration in mind, uh, this was the magnitude versus separation along the x-axis that we were able to achieve. And um, the x-axis down here is measured in units of meters. And so it goes from a minimum separation of around two centimeters to a maximum separation of 10 centimeters. And within, and within that range, we cover the full uh, range of magnitudes we want to cover from mostly zero to uh, around a little more than uh, 0.7 Tesla. Um, and so with that separation in mind, at that magnitude, the maximum difference we were able to see is 3% um, along the z-axis and 5% uh, along the y-axis. And so, but and for most of the region though, it is less than that by quite a bit, which is good for us because we want minimum divergence in order for the property, in order for the domains and the material to be uniform throughout the thin sample. Um, and so now that I had the theoretical design and like the design placement of the magnets, I then had to create a uh, way to hold the magnets in that configuration um, and move them back and forth. Um, we decided to go with a lead screw based design for moving them back and forth because lead, sc lead screws are in the price range we're looking at the cheapest, most precise and strongest uh, solution available where they're simply controllable by a single motor um, to get to translate a rotational motion into linear motion. And then the materials that we decided to go for are, we, tr we need to make sure that they wouldn't interfere with the magnetic field at the sample region. And so we had to go with mostly paramagnetic or diamagnetic materials like aluminum, brass, and other non-ferrous metals. Um, and so 
I made all these parts, or I made this part on the left using aluminum, or it will be made in aluminum. Um, and this is the part that will be holding the magnets. Um, and so the magnets would slot into the holes seen at the top here. And um, I'm not sure if you're able to see my mouse, actually. Could somebody like chime in and let me know? Because I'm using my mouse. Yep. <laughs> OK, good. Um, so yeah, the magnets would slot into the two holes seen at the top left here and would be held down firmly with a top plate, which you'll see later. Um, and then using these two grooves that the lead screw would fit into, the magnets would slide back and forth and remove them back and forth from one another. And here's a top-down view of the entire apparatus as a whole, which might be easier to understand when you can finally see um, the rendering of it. Um, and this, all these designs and uh, renderings were made in SOLIDWORKS. But um, so as you can see, the lead screws slot in to the magnet assemblies there. And then they would, using a stepper motor attached at the back left here, um, it would rotate to push these assemblies forward and backwards to move the magnets closer and further apart from one another to actually change the strength of the field. Um, and then I have an animation of what the magnet assembly actually looks like and how it is assembled. So the plan is that we'd slot the magnets in and then to actually hold them in place firmly, we would screw down um, a top plate over them, which would secure them to the bottom and make sure that there's no wiggle room. And then, um, yeah. And all of that would be uh, made in aluminum and the screws would be non-ferrous screws like brass screws. Um, and if it's gonna let me go to the next slide, which I really hope it's gonna let me do. There we go. Um, and so that's as far as we were able to get. We ran into a few issues with finding a machinist last minute. And um, the machine, uh, the CN, not CNC, the uh, mill we had at our college was not able to make the parts precise enough for our needs. And so the future outlook for the next person to take on this project will be to create a control program. And I'm proposing using a Raspberry Pi for that because it is easier, easier program than a microcontroller and it will allow you to talk wirelessly to a laptop by remote accessing the Raspberry Pi, which means you don't need to carry it on the laptop in order to use the apparatus and it would make it fairly portable and lightweight. Um, and then we have purchased uh, a large stepper motor and associated motor controller that would be used in conjunction with the Raspberry Pi to actually turn the lead screw precisely. And the stepper motor has a resolution of, I believe, 1.2 degrees, um, which is plenty for our application. Um, and then, yeah, an apparatus must be designed to allow this to rotate along around a stationary sample that would be placed in the middle. And I proposed placing this entire assembly on one large turntable that would then be turned with another circle motor or stepper motor. Um, <laughs> and then the future student taking on this project must assemble the whole apparatus gets and it. get the magnet holders machined by a machine shop that can make it precise enough. Um, and so all of this is in order to create was essentially a permanent magnet MOAC apparatus um, where the sample will be in the middle and there will be gaps in the middle to allow laser light to go in, reflect off of the sample. And by measuring the polarization of that laser light, you can glean information about the magnetic domain structure of the material and create hysteresis curves such as the one seen on the right. Um, and I think that's where I'm going to leave it. Is there any questions? Thank you. Uh, uh, questions from in here, yeah. What is the practical application for this process? Right, could you hear that? Uh, yeah. Um, so for the for what process the uh, vector magnet or the uh, MOC apparatus and looking at the magnetic properties of the material? Well, the the whole purpose of your of your exploration into this process. What is the end goal? Uh, I think Dr. Lee can answer that question more yes. because I was not can, as concerned with the theoretical applications. Yes, can people hear me? Yep. Okay, so you're looking at the end goal. You're looking at the practical application. The note, the idea behind this is to create a vector magnet on, that can apply magnetic fields on magnetic materials to manipulate the domain structures. What we're interested in are um, 
where the, what kinds of domain structures form. You can tell that from um, information they can glean from uh, a hysteresis loops that you see on the right, for example, the curl elasticity versus a magnetic field. Um, you can also use this use this apparatus to look at the do, uh, the domain dynamics. In particular, you can look at the fluctuation of the laser light scattered from the sample in order to see or get information about the characteristic times um, uh, over which the domains fluctuate and change shape. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, one last quick question. Okay. So um, uh, I like your analysis, and it assumes, um, as far as I understand, uh, permanent magnets that were cylindrical and perfect in some sense. But I imagine if you build this with permanent magnets, they will not be perfect. Uh, um, real magnets will not be perfect, and I wonder how that uh, will affect the the uh, the properties of the magnetic field, which needs to be so uniform. Um, yeah, so in my simulation, there is the ability to change the magnetization of each magnet individually. And so if the magnetization of the magnets, which you're right, they're not going to be perfect, are actually off, you can test that. And once you measure that and put that into the simulation and adjust the position of the magnets in order to find a more optimal position based on your real magnets. Um, additionally, the paper that I'm referencing has another analytic solution for magnets that have off axis or off kilter magnetizations. Um, however, that their equations for that are very complicated and would be difficult to implement into Python. And we are just going to run on the assumption that our magnets are on center and if they're not we will just order new magnets that are on center because that would be an unacceptable amount of defect does that answer your question yeah, thank you all right that's all right well th uh, let's uh, th thank the speaker uh, 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 uh,